Welcome everybody to the librarian.support real-time session with Jason Broughton. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a few updates. Uh, once again, this is an opportunity to, uh, we know that a lot of librarians and library staff are at home, working from home or working in facilities that aren't currently allowing the public in out of safety concerns, and we want to very much support that decision. I'm sure that'll probably come up in our conversation today. Uh, as part of that, we're doing these real-time sessions, bringing brilliant people in to talk about important topics for the current crisis and what happens afterwards. Uh, we also want to make sure that when you're in the site, uh, you will not have microphone or uh, video privileges, but if you click on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a, a pink-purple tab. You click on that, there's a discussion, an ongoing discussion there. That's being monitored, so as you get questions throughout it, please pose them there and we'll bring it up here. Um, two quick updates. Uh, we began, I think it was yesterday, everything begins to blur together, uh, talking about the importance when Matt um, Finch was on on Tuesday, he talked about the importance of sort of freelancers, consultants, and folks working in the library ecosystem that are really gonna be you know, heavily affected during this time. We all are, but these are folks that uh, make a lot of, you know, make their living by connecting and working in groups, and a lot of them have moved online, so we want to support them. So we created a freelancers consultant speaker uh, directory. It's currently got five uh, folks in it, but we're looking to get as many as possible. So if you're interested and have services to offer, please go to librarian.support, click on the freelance or the consultants link, and enter your information. And if you're looking for people to provide lots of different kinds of support, go there as well and, and support those folks in the ecosystem. Uh, the other, and, and these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to do, which is quickly respond. Uh, we started getting some questions from libraries looking for what are other people doing in Topic X, the current one is around materials handling. So we're posting those on the site and making available discussion groups and options, so I hope you will have a chance if you have questions to raise them there or to respond. And last update before we jump into it, uh, we had uh, we set this time nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. because we felt it was a good overlap between EU with our partners uh, through PL 2030 uh, and folks in the United States. But um, people in the Eastern Hemisphere have kind of noticed that doesn't work very well for them, and so starting. 9 a.m. Sydney time, um, we will be having an Eastern Hemisphere after hours. So one of these, but, but much less with speakers and much more about just getting together, sharing and talking. So Monday at 9 a.m., we're gonna do our first one of those. So please, if, if you're uh, watching the archive of this or if you're really, really tired right now, feel free to join us then as well. So lots of updates, lots going on. I have to say it is, it is exciting and thrilling uh, to watch this community come together and um, really talk about and use this as a time for figuring out how we serve our communities at this time. Speaking of which, and particularly the communities in the state of Vermont, our guest today, uh, really our conversation partner is Jason Broughton, uh, who is the State Librarian of Vermont. I'm going to, to read a little bit of his background, um, which is super impressive. Uh, he, was a, he was appointed by Governor Phil Scott uh, in 2019 as the first African American to serve uh, as the Vermont State Librarian. Uh, he came to Vermont with extensive experience in library service. He served as assistant state librarian, supervising library staff consultants who provided training and assistance to community libraries, as well as staff of the audio, braille, large print, and ebook library. For a decade, uh, Broughton held various library roles, including workforce development trainer and outreach coordinator at the South Carolina State Library and Director of Library Support Services, Assistant Director of Public Services, and Interim Librarian at the Live Oaks Public Library in Savannah, Georgia. Prior to his library career, he spent over a decade as an educator, and, because I have to do this, is a, uh, we are so, so proud that he is an alum of the University of South Carolina School of Library and Information Science, and one of our inaugural fellows. So our fellows program is where we bring brilliant and smart people to sort of serve as ambassadors, helping us know what's going on in the communities, things uh, we need to be doing within our program curriculum and such, and hopefully letting the rest of the world know what we're doing as well. So, so thrilled that he could be our, one of our first fellow in that program. 
Good morning, Jason. That was a lot Good of Good morning. <laughs> How are you? I am doing, I would say, uh, very well at this time and uh, just navigating it all, I think, as we all are trying to do. And um, yes, orienting ourselves to the new reality and we will see what the future will actually hold because it's going to be interesting. Can you just give us a quick update on you know, what is the state of Vermont with the pandemic and state of, of the libraries up there? Okay, yes. So Vermont, um, as we know at the current time, um, with regards to libraries, we still think we hold the largest amount of public libraries per capita. Um, technically, it can go as high as 196 when the uh, summers are available and there are winters that shut it down. So we kind of have communication with 182. Each of them are their own individual systems. There are no branches at all. And you should know the state of Vermont, um, from a demographic standpoint, is a very small state. Um, at the last census count, it had uh, 625,000 people. Our largest city is Burlington, and it has about 50,000 people. So that probably might give some people some interesting um, caveats to say, wow, that's, that's very different. No branch style. Everything is primarily local controlled, so that means there is no county government, but there are counties. So that also kind of lets you see how things play out as the nuances. At the current moment, Governor Scott has ordered what is called a stay at home, stay safe declaration. It is not a shelter in place as New York or um, Massachusetts might be moving to, as we understand shortly. And the reason why that's um, a distinction is because it does allow a little bit more movement. The goal is we hope that those measures will mitigate the incoming uptick that we expect. And some people might still wonder, well, how is that kind of possible since you're a small state? You need to pay attention to probably what is around us. We have the juggernaut that is New York next to us and Boston underneath us, Montreal at the top in Canada, and then to the side, New Hampshire. So we are boxed in by um, a lot of interesting states that have much more people and are about to experience from their point of view, a major amount of uptick, especially in New York. So what we believe will happen is we will have the overflow. We have had a large amount of people from New Hampshire and um, New York trickle into the state. We unfortunately have had uh, seven deaths um, very rapidly um, over the week. And we swelled from having two people in a week's time to now over 100 um, confirmed cases. And half of those are from out of state versus actual persons who reside in Vermont. So for us, it's all about trying to now do a lot of social distancing, make sure that people are constantly aware that if they're sick, they should stay home. And if at all applicable, try to balance this and keep work going. Um, state government shifted rather quickly. Um, we have a staff of 20. Everybody is able to uh, telework. We do have the uh, ABLE Library, Audio Braille, Large Print, Electronic Resources that we uh, rename from the Library of the Blind and Physically Handicapped. And what that allows us to do is to have them come in on certain days because we pre um, or uploaded and front loaded a lot of things for our citizens in that perspective to assist them because it is a vital service. We will continue that until the US Postal Service and the National Library Service and the Library of Congress say you might need to stop because we found that transmission hangs out a little bit longer on paper or boxes. So that's kind of where we're at. We're um, in a good place. Outside is sunny. We had a major snowstorm two days ago. And so it's um, just charting a, a new course and we're seeing what it looks like. Well, thank you for the update, and I think that's an excellent way of, of transitioning into a topic I know that you're knee-deep in and have a lot of interest even outside of current, which is talking about emergency management. Where How, how are we, uh, how are libraries, and, and what do librarians need to think about when they encounter different librarians, and how do they prepare for that, correct? Correct. Um, in this case, there's a lot of things that I have been able to experience in my um, past that have, I would say, made me kind of realize where we're at now and how one can chart a course forward. Um, contagions and virus outbreaks are not a standard emergency management protocol. This is something very, very new because that impacts you very, very um, 
discreetly and it has no boundaries whatsoever versus a hurricane, a tornado, or earthquake, a landslide, a snowfall. Those are things that, you know, you can say we have some physical items to deal with. In this, it doesn't matter where you are because you have to live and breathe it. So for libraries, I think what we can work to do since our new reality for those who can do this is to understand what virtual services look like along with um, financial preparedness and planning and of course looking at um, health and wellness so those are the topics that i kind of want to talk about today for our um, conversation well let's jump in where do you want to start all right so let's my end i would say i want to kind of make sure people are aware of what is probably going to be coming after this and it might sound a little bit um, too forward for some to say well we're just dealing with this situation right now why are we needing to kind of gently also pay attention to what's coming down the pipe and the main focus should be health and wellness well in our current situation our economy is tied to what we do health and wellness is of the utmost importance within that however if one is paying attention and i'm not saying the stock market that's a different type of economy. If you look around and you pay attention to what really is going on in some other different types of economies, small business, um, entrepreneurs, and then of course, yes, some big and large scale manufacturing and a variety of other sectors, you will begin to see that unfortunately there are massive layoffs that are happening. Um, in one week, three million people were unemployed. We are going to see an uptick in unemployment like we've probably never seen in a very, very long time. And so the stock market is not the thing to keep your eye on. What you really want to be focused on is the unemployment rate. And last week and into this week, it has been startling and stunning how many people have been laid off. That is why you're going to be seeing a large amount of conversation in the uh, US Congress, and I'm quite sure in other countries, about what to do as we go forward with this situation. It could be very similar to what happened to um, the world with the global recession starting really kind of like in 2006 when people started paying attention to the housing market and other indicators. And it really started in 2008 all the way up until about 2012. And in that case, libraries did some very innovative things. We turned our attention to workforce. So that meant we had to look at this unique reality of, wow, we are information, but we've never kind of talked about how do you help people with jobs and small business and entrepreneurship and social services. And that's where we have kind of idling nice and for a while. And I think a lot of people were transitioning away from that. And now we have this unfortunate reality that has brought us back to say, what does this look like now? So it's interesting because when I, I you, you, as you point out, in 2008, this was the huge issue, which is how do we deal with workforce, how do we deal with folks? And it was interesting because I saw libraries going everything from sort of, we're here to provide internet connections and materials to hear some stuff on job seeking. Uh, but one of the things that really I noticed in the last go around, and I think I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, was looking at the library as a connector service for all of the new services coming out. In other words, it wasn't just libraries dealing with unemployment, but you had federal programs, you had a lot of local, whether that's county or city, once again, mm -hmm. you point out different states, different systems, and obviously we have different countries. But the idea was when someone, you know, if they touched any one of these services, particularly the library, they could connect into these other services. Is that is that what you're seeing? I definitely still see that going on, um, just like we have access points when we are looking at how people will access our collections in different ways on websites. Libraries were becoming and still are just a bit lightly touch points for social services and human services is what you kind of call them. And those are to me very, very unique perspectives. There are some of our patrons and even people who are saying, why are we really doing this? I, I don't understand that. You know, libraries are really about books. And that usually makes me start a really great conversation to say, actually, I want to tell you, you're, you're, you're a little bit um, out of sync. I don't like to tell people that they're right or wrong. Um, those are very powerful words. The goal would be to tell people, do you understand the mission of a library? A library's mission from its inception is information information comes in all types of formats and what we're offering now are physical forms of information 
um, experiential services in a sense. You're actually doing face to face. And we should never forget that communication, programming, story times are all bits of information. If you didn't have that information, you wouldn't be able to guess what? Think, dream, have possibility, contemplate, reflect. A book is just a format. And when you're able to kind of allow people to understand the library is moving to understand the community, that allows us to kind of then get into, let's talk about these different factors of how information is provided to people versus just a print book or virtual in the sense of digital. And that is where I see a lot of libraries um, navigating it in some very, very unique ways. It's always um, heartening to see what libraries are doing across the world, in addition to people just saying, here's what we're going to try. So it's quite unique, especially at this time, because virtual services are going to be um, for a large part of the world right now who are under um, threat in the sense of having to shelter in place or try to mitigate contact with different items. What will it mean to still have a voice to your community and provide services? So what kind of things can libraries be doing right now then, do you think, around the, the workforce issue? Is it preparing oh for when they come back or, or as we speak? There are going to be two, two tiers to this, and there might be a, a few others. Um, one is keep an eye, if you can, on what is going on with your local community and even in your state or in your country with regards to what is happening with the workforce. Um, unemployment is probably going to be something that people are going to really focus on. So having access to information to help people through that process, because um, it's not, I don't want to say cumbersome, but it is something that people have to fill out and constantly check in and do different items. Some of those rules might be relaxed at this current time, but again, people will have to go through a process. So if a library can find a way to have that information and make it available for their community where they are able to provide it even virtually and say, here are the steps of what you need to do, here's how you now have to fill this out, that would be a very helpful benefit while not having, of course, access for people the old fashioned way we might have done it to come in and use a public computer. So the goal is going to be figuring out, can you now get back to those contacts if you have them and say, how can I now assist you with this information to get more people informed about the actual situation? And that's gonna go for a variety of areas, particularly in the US when it comes to social services, uh, SNAP, TANF, WIC, all of the social service programs that people are actually doing. In other cases, for example, think about this. You have to go in, at least in the US um, side of things, into a local Department of Motor Vehicles. How are people going to deal with driver's license um, operations if you're having to renew or get a sticker or an inspection and the state is saying, we're probably going to be down for eight to 12 weeks and there will be no face-to-face -face services. What does that look like? Lots of transitions are going to have to be thought through very, very deeply. Another area that I think people would want to also focus on is for Vermont, this is also a very, very big factor. Vermont doesn't have a lot of large industry within the state. Lots of this is midsize and a lot of it is small business, particularly mom and pops. So making sure that you understand your economy to say, well, wait a minute, mm, I like the little bakery that I go to to get um, red velvet cupcakes. Oh my goodness, they're gonna go under. It's not saying fully find a way to keep them alive, but it's to say, you might want to start looking at ways in which you can help and assist small business, because that's also gonna be a unique caveat that will be coming out of the US Congress and trying to figure out making sure how do people kind of stay alive at this very moment. And there are lots of aid packages being talked about, but again, it has so many different strata. You have entrepreneurs that are about to go under, you have small business with mom and pops, you have mid-sized industries, and then of course you have the workforce, the people itself. So libraries are, I don't want to say in a good position, it's now in a unique position on how to deliver information that is timely and relevant back to their community. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking once again with the last downturn um, that Two things that sort of struck me. One was a, a, a library in rural Illinois that um, as the economy, you know, as, as revenue decreased, states would begin to pull back services, particularly for support of small businesses and startups. And uh, in this particular city, or town, um, they were going to close the office for small business support. And they said, you know, we just can't afford the rent, things like that. And the library 
stood up and said, we will house that service. We'll take the, the consultant that was sort of traveling around. They can be centered in the library. We can provide that level of support, still have the public access. I'm also thinking more recently of uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library in Ohio that really just did an amazing partnership with county and city services, particularly around um, immigrant populations, transient populations, where a lot of people to keep these social services, food support, et cetera, they had to have, they had to check in on a regular basis. They had to have almost a permanent address, even though part of the problem was they didn't. And so the library stood up and said, we will be your permanent address. You can check in through us. If you check out a book, we will report to civil, you know, to, to the civil services that in essence, you're here and still a county member. That will count as evidence of, of participation. They really pulled forward. But I, you know, I'm gonna, you're in a very unique position as a state library to answer, well, I hope to answer this question. Don't mean to put you on this point. I'll try. Okay, um, during the, the last recession, there were lots of stimulus packages around things like broadband there were a lot of different stimulus packages and those were going to the states and I, and I believe it's Vermont and I apologize but Vermont had um, uh, put in a gigabit loop and the idea was to create a broadband connectivity particularly to, to rural populations and the state library and the states were part of that yes. plan putting it together and so what I'm what I'm thinking for people listening to this sort of preparing now at a high level is how can libraries situate themselves to be part of the new economic stimulus packages? Oh my goodness, that, wow. I am, wow, I have to think about this, not <laughs> Sorry. that it's hard. <laughs> there are so many layers to this that I need to try to address in a very concise way. Um, let me start off with a foundation that people are unaware of that's very important at the same time going forward. Um, this is not braggadocio. One of the things that I was not expecting when I became state librarian here was um, the level of work that I was doing. The Department of Libraries for Vermont is the state library. We sit under an agency known as the Agency of Administration. So we get to look at the operation of state government from our level. Um, the secretary, Secretary Suzanne Young. Within that, um, I guess that my boss kind of noticed how I worked. And within that, what was quite unique since this year is 2020 in the US, for those who don't know, we have a thing called the census. It's a constitutional item that is required every 10 years, known as the decennial census. What that means is you need to be counted. So this goes a little bit into when you talked about people who don't have place to be recognized and be counted. Those are all parts of things that interact with the census that can go into the question about broadband. So I'll get to that. The census is important because it has a count. You should know the census is still rolling on. It's going to suspend a lot of uh, field work operations, but uniquely, I am also a Vermont chair of the census, <laughs> in addition to being the state librarian. <laughs> Why is that important? The learning curve of that is just amazing because the census in the United States is so important. It deals with appropriations, and that means based on how many people are in your state and your count and where they're located, you can have redistricting going on, you can have services, lots of money from the federal government is appropriated based on your count. And if people aren't counted, those services do not get provided. So if you think about that in the sense of what about food programs, after school, library services, if the count is incorrect, which this year would be quite unique, it means less money for those massive federal programs. So that impacts a variety of things, which goes into, for example, IT infrastructure. Um, Marty Reed was a state librarian who assisted that um, prior to me coming on. And within that, we do have an item where a lot of our libraries are considered anchor institutions. We have what is called a fiber connect situation, but that kind of slowed. So when you said Vermont, it had its nice lead way, but that kind of appeared to have gotten sidetracked. And now we're starting to have new conversations because Vermont is very, very nuanced. It's geogra geography unfortunately limits a lot of connectivity. So we have parts of our state that do not have connection whatsoever. 
And you might say, wow, Vermont is seen as very progressive here in the U.S. In that instance, not so much. And the reason also is because there's an environmental um, impact that Vermonters like to have as well. And so we don't have a lot of satellites or dishes or things that obstruct views because we have very mountainous regions and people live in the valley. What has occurred, though, is now there is discussion about looking at things through um, what I call them uh, semantic webs. Imagine if a population, a town, were to try to figure out how many places you could import Wi-Fi and have this web ring where people could continuously drive through or walk through and just keep connecting to Wi-Fi as you go through a specific space. Other types of populations are looking to make themselves a community in which their um, infrastructure allows them to have a little bit more connectivity in a very unique way. But that's going to take some time as some of the providers. I would say from a personal opinion that in Vermont, some of the locations might not be um, very fiduciary in allowing revenue to come to a company like Comcast or Verizon. So they might not see it as a very big, important thing to do. So other measures have to be taken. And that's where we're at with it. But now this is renewed conversation, especially during this time, about how we could probably look at trying to make more decisive measures and having people connected. Because it is, believe it or not, a utility if you are not doing things online you're just not connected to the world yeah it, it's it that word i mean i was just listening to a discussion i believe was on the media the other day the the, the show and podcast and and that's the idea that you know this whole net neutrality discussion and who could connect and and what are the incentives and what's the regulation scheme around the internet if nothing else comes out of the past 15 days it's the idea that you can no longer deny that the internet is a utility it is a necessary function just up there with water and power and Correct. so i'm wondering if that's going to change how people think and regulate and and support it as it were. I, I fully agree on your um question though about um the cuyahoga library system one of the things that's been very interesting to me um going just a bit back in a different slant is how libraries have adjusted to be very community centered and focused in the user experience in a variety of ways. I think given the situation, if we really want to deal with information the way we say we would like to deal with information as uh, librarians, we shouldn't be um, necessarily on the side of those entities. Like when you mentioned county government, federal government, state governments, um, I'm in a unique position because of being a state librarian and part of a variety of different groups. And if you were to pick it apart, you would kind of say, looking at what I do, wow, you're actually considered an embedded librarian. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what we need to start be start thinking about. What does it mean not to be side sided with something, but to say, okay, let me come into your organization and say, well, here's how I can help you. We can look at archiving preservation. We can look at informational portals to provide user access in different ways. Um, we can help you catalog information, different types of items, along with just giving you resources so that you can make the most informed decision. That's a different type of thinking if we start to say at right now, if your library wanted to connect to a county government or even to a state, what does it look like when that person says, here is how I can help you, even from a communication standpoint. Our libraries are communication hubs. They can provide information outwards constantly. Of course, you hope that it's reputable and it's consistent and it is something that people will trust, but that's a different conversation. But I think embedded librarianship should not be thought about in a different way in connecting into different organizations to assist during such times. Yeah. It I know that, that for many years, state librarians, I mean, all libraries go through waves of phases of who are we and what are we, et cetera. But I know state libraries in particular, when they were transitioning from being legislative support entities, doing reference and collections and such, it was kind of like, what do we do now? I think, and then when I look across yours and, and many other successful state libraries, a pivot to community, a pivot to supporting public libraries, school libraries through um, statewide licensing, but this notion of being the embedded library where it's like we're bringing services now not just to answer your questions on a legislative issue, but we can really talk about how do we 
specifically create services and bring network people together. That's that is a really cool idea. Correct. I want to kind of move into um, yeah. that next phase. So we talked about kind of the social ramifications that libraries should be preparing. It's dust off what we did in 2008 to the present because <laughs> we might be going back into that for a little bit. So think about your workforce resources, virtual services that you can do um, to help the community. But for the libraries themselves, I really think it will be extremely important that you start now, not after this is over, you start now on looking at your own financial preparation. And so financial awareness during emergencies is important because you might want to begin looking at, well, how do I, am I able to spend more money to purchase eBooks right now? Am I able to reconfigure what we're doing so that it will become less in-person and more virtual just for a temporary aspect. That's a little bit harder to ramp up because guess what? That requires contracts and different types of connections. And so you have to one, have the money to even begin the conversation. On top of that, if the economy appears the way it is predicted to appear, libraries also need to be prepared of all calibers from a university, um, academic, public, school, to begin to understand what is the revenue stream that will be diminished and how does that impact us? What might we be asked to do given that there is not much money coming in? And if you understand how we are public libraries, unless you're a nonprofit fully, there are libraries that do that raise lots of money um, separately. If you are aligned to a state um, institution or federal in a unique way and that revenue stream begins to dry up, you need to understand how you're going to then navigate in that new reality. And that definitely is something I think a lot of libraries need to prepare for now. And the reason is we usually don't see the immediate impact. In state government, it usually is unfortunately, guess what, the very next year because the taxes have not been paid and all of a sudden there's this massive drop in services across the board in state government. So right now, most states in the U.S. and U.S. territories pretty much are going to be okay. They are definitely looking at what does this look like when we get out of this? Because we'll begin to feel it starting around October with the federal um, fiscal alignment in the U.S. and then for us normally in Vermont and a few others, the June of this year will start to give us some indicators. So since we've done a bit of this, we've gone through a, a economic tsunami relatively recently, do you see some best practices around you know, preparing to function in this environment? Well, first you have to, um, I think, deal with some personal items first. You have to be comfortable understanding money. And believe it or not, some people say, oh, I don't want to talk about the personal. No, we all have personal stances regarding money. I have met people, um, sadly, who are terrified to talk about money because they'll say, I don't know anything about money and numbers and I'm just a librarian. And I'm like, but if you told me in a few seconds ago, as you introduced yourself to me, you were the library director, then you are definitely the person who has to deal with the money. If you are unsure how to do that, you better quickly find somebody who can assist you very competently because you will have to manage that. And that's not an easy task because it means you have to then connect two sides of the same coin, the human side with the fiscal side. The fiscal side has no no impacts in the sense other than you look at the numbers, but it does have that human connection to say, if we can't pay for this, this is what's going to happen to a group of people. Therein lies the tragedy sometimes for people to have to make that hard decision. But if you understand the numbers and you can examine it in a way where you say, hmm, what does this look like to decrease this? Are we able to legally shift here? What is the aspect of talking to other people? I am a big, big proponent of people getting out there and talking to people to ask for help. And sometimes that means having hard conversations with people that you might not have connected with or you don't like connecting with. But guess what? During times of emergencies, that burden has to be um, laid down and we have to all uh, become adults and say, I need help. Here's what I'm asking and can you help me? And if that is, I believe, done in a very um, honest and open way, it should begin to offer you some insight into how to move forward. But the fiscal side definitely going forward is going to be something that libraries should definitely pay attention because you're going to feel the impacts of this when this is over. Okay, so back to that 
of emergency preparedness. We've talked mm -hmm. now about um, the economics. We've talked about um, predicting and starting now on what the economic sort of macroeconomic picture is going to be. Um, we've talked a little bit about what the skills um, around finances are at the level of we need them. <laughs> what are what else? What else should folks be considering in terms of emergency management? I think an item that people uh, sometimes don't pay attention to because it does require um, a lot of forethought and a lot of conversation and constant review and revising. And that is to look at your operations and logistics. It means having what is called a continuity of operating um, plans or known as a COOP. One can look it up. Um, I will be providing some items to uh, Dr. Lankis that will hopefully be helpful for everybody. Emergency management planning would have a coop within it. So you might say, well, I, we just have an emergency management plan. Most people definitely have those, but for very unique purposes, tornado, fire, uh, bug infestation, water issues, mold, that definitely is still good. The continuity is kind of the plan before you move into your, your full emergency management plan. So a coop says, Here's what we need to do right before we launch into this. Here's who we need to start calling. This is how we're going to gear ourselves up. Are we going to be in the building? Are we not? How do we connect with each other? So it gives you, here are all of your plans you need to begin looking at. Do you have a communications plan? Do you have a logistics plan? What happens if communication goes down? You start thinking through those. And that is, yes, part of a larger emergency management. But the COOP is the precursor to say, we believe an issue is coming pull out your coop because we are going to be examining if this does go the way we believe, we will need to move quickly into our emergency management plan. So it then begins to get everybody thinking, I need to prepare with uh, connections to the bank because our HR department just said they're going to go virtual. What does that mean for me? Because when you're in the emergency management and you realize payroll has to be done, if you didn't pre-think about that, you're going to have problems. A coop would even say, let's make sure that we connect with our IT department to find out how many people can work through telework, who has to be in the building. It just gives you a full scale pre-thought for all of those different disasters. So continuity planning is extremely helpful. And guess what? As you do the continuity planning, you might even find you cannot do what you want to do, and therefore you have to adjust completely. Um, tabletop exercises. Yeah, you can talk through them. Some are also physical, but ensuring that you understand just having an example of here is this situation that just occurred. How would you operate knowing this? And believe it or not, as you walk through a tabletop and everybody starts to discuss how they see it and what they plan to contribute, you will start to see where the gaps are at. If you, David, are the director and I am your HR person and you're saying, well, we definitely need to look at how we're going to deal with situations in HR, with management, complaints, not to mention, are we still going to hire? What about payroll? How are we going to deal with all these other things with OSHA rules? I might look at you and say, well, I, I don't understand that. I thought you had your plan. I, I didn't know you wanted me to do that. Those are conversations that we have to have because you're going to be looking at me saying, well, you're the HR person. And I might say, but you didn't give me what you want me to really do other than go do it yourself. You need to think those steps through. Um, big systems usually have that. And believe it or not, some interestingly very rule and small libraries have that as well. But if you've never heard of that term, it's going to be important that you look at trying to examine what a continuity plan would look like before you get into your full scale emergency management. Very good. Very good. So that raises a, a question, and we've had, this is where we, we I love doing this because it's really a continuation of <laughs> lots of conversations over the past tech. Talk to me about, you know, I, I obviously have a special interest in librarian preparation, but talk to me about the skills that you see um, library librarians and library staff needing, whether it's around this, but, but you know, you've talked, for example, about the embedded librarian issue, right? So that we're talking about um, librarians not simply saying, hey, we're a public service, we're over here, come to us if you need us, but actually going out, working in, being part of, in some ways, all the government services and I'm guessing private and federal services, et cetera. So the idea of connectivity, networking, if you will, the idea of 
you talked about finances and business, the idea of, you know, got to be able to work with money and see what's going on. What are some of the other skills that you think that, that we need to do a better job of, of, of bringing to folks? Oh, my goodness. This is so much more heartfelt. So this is going to be probably a mix of personal and professional um, and a little bit of just what I um, experienced in my own um, path to this. We all are very unique people. And so it's kind of hard to say one set type um, because each of us, if you think about our own gifts, whether you're an introvert, an extrovert, um, middle of the road, we all can have things that we can examine in different ways. I would definitely say you need somebody who is able to be strategic. And that really also means you are a person who is constantly aware of opportunity. An opportunity in the sense is not in the sense to say you are looking to make something um, or get something out of it. It's to say an opportunity to collaborate, an opportunity to connect, an opportunity to, to assist. And if you're able to pay attention to that with your librarianship, you will begin to see a variety of unique situations that you will be afforded. And that is through the use of connection. You might be working, let's say, in a capacity with IT, and the next thing you know, you're talking about how to offer story times virtually. Well, that would be an interesting way how you ended up there, right? Because you would have said, well, normally we would have started with how can we offer the story time, but you might be at a major IT meeting and someone is saying, well, we're looking at trying to connect people to different services. And if you're thinking, it's like, oh, let's talk about how we could do this for a library. Could we offer virtual services? Could we have a book club that's now done virtually? Could we start looking at how we could have sessions like this through the library school? And that can come in different ways if you are open to the power of paying attention. So being strategic, looking at opportunity, um, a person that is aware, and as a lot of people would say, uh, young people, um, being woke, which means are you mindful in this moment? You're not distracted. You're actually paying attention on what's being focused. You have to have somebody who also is a person that will look at a variety of options and will try to make the best and most informed decision for what is required at that moment. That's very difficult because that's talking to the inner core of who we are. Sometimes we want to do things for ourselves, and that can be a variety of different aspects versus the community. But if you look at some of the projects or different items that you can get into, it's always going to be what's good for this library, what's good to navigate this situation, and how can we have the best and most successful impact across the board for as many people. So having people who are able to be nimble, we, I think, in this field are uniquely nimble in a variety of ways. Like right now, librarians quickly are able to adjust. I, I'm just so beyond amaze how we're able to do that. But then at the same time, we are some of the most conservative people in our industry, reticent to change. How dare you put that book in that collection? It cannot go there. Well, there are certain things that we need to adjust. So in that case, you have to know when you want to be nimble and when you do need to be conservative. So you have to have people who are able to be even keeled all the time. Uh, flexibility. But you have to know your craft. You need to really understand what it is that you do well and do best, and then you can move forward in a variety of, of different areas. If you're a great youth services person, keep doing that because you're going to be the expert. If you're into collection, uh, development, and management, if you're a great administrator, if you are an adult programming person, if you are into social media, keep doing that, but hone your craft. But at the same time, always be open to learning new things because it'll help you as the environment begins to shift and change. So those are the areas that I think will benefit a lot of people and a lot of libraries. If they, one, can simply pay attention to what is in front of them, they will begin to see an opportunity of many multitudes across the landscape begin to open up because people are constantly now, we all hear it, I never knew the library did this. What I usually get now is it's amazing that the library is doing this versus the old fashioned, why is the library doing this? <laughs>
But <laughs> well, so you're you're in a really interesting position to talk about the skills and such because and it's one that's not that's shared in, in interesting ways across the globe. And it's this. Vermont has, as you mentioned, a lot of libraries functioning for service communities. But it does not necessarily have a lot of MLIS trained certified librarians doing it. And what I'm thinking of is there are people on right now watching this and will be watching the archive. Um, the Netherlands has no formal library science program, right? So even if you're in a big city, et cetera, et cetera, there may not be a degree available. We had we know that um, in the Midwest of the United States, there are folks that you know they can't not only do they not have a master's of library science but they would never be able to make enough in salary to recoup the cost of that and so there are a lot Great. of librarians out there um that, that don't necessarily have the professional preparation or formal preparation you've done i believe a partnership with the american library association talking about sort of skilling up folks that are coming from that and of course as a, as a director of a library science program i hate you for that <laughs> but, but, but can you talk about the reality of how do you prepare, let's just say, whether it's a state's worth or a large group of, of folks to work in the library functions, particularly in a crisis situation that may not have gone through and have that, whether it's the confidence or the set of skills that are common. Does that make sense? It does. Um, Vermont, yes, has a limited number of MLIS or MIS within that, and LS as, the, as well. Uniquely, um, very, very low number within that. From my perspective, what the State Library has done way before I got here for many, many years, I think almost 30, maybe 40 years, they have an in-house program that normally will try to train you on the tenements and the mission and vision of what a public library is to do. And that person, once they complete the training, gets a certificate. At the current moment, we are looking at reciprocity with a few states, but right now it's just um, primarily in Vermont, where you will have that basic understanding of what a library does. These are people of all calibers, um, from high school diplomas, all the way up to master degrees, but of different items. And they are all very capable. They're very passionate. They got into wanting to be um, a part of a library for a variety of different reasons. And the goal that we have at the current moment is to ensure that they understand what a library is and what it can do for their community. That, however, has to be balanced with, of course, what the community can do. Vermont will probably never be able to at this current moment be similar to New York or Boston. It's just not going to happen, or even New, ha New Hampshire. But there are parts of those states that also face the same items. So if you are in upper state New York, um, going out to the west all the way up to Ohio, um, definitely parts of um, upper parts of New Hampshire and definitely Maine, we're on the similar boat. There are libraries and communities that serve populations anywhere, believe it or not, from 30 people to about 500, maybe um, three or 4,000. And that's it, that one little library is there. They may not be able to afford to pay a person with that. So the important thing is making sure that they understand what a library can do, what the purpose is, and the key for us is constant education. Um, with regards to the ALA, we kind of uh, did our unique item with that, and that is uh, slightly still ongoing. It's adjusted a bit, but our goal is to give people as many resources and different perspectives. There is a local perspective, a statewide perspective, and of course, a national. And I believe that's important because if you don't offer a variety of perspectives, you begin to kind of lose touch, and sometimes you become very, very insular. And that's something that you don't want because then you're going to be in a variety of unpleasant situations um, where you could have some people say, well, I did this collection because I like these books. Well, as a trained librarian, you don't do that. We all have our perspectives. We know that the goal, though, however, is to offer um, equity and equality in our collection. It should be diverse and it should also be reverse, uh, robust and it should also, in some cases, be conflicting in other words, if you're going to have a lot of things on liberalism, you definitely should be having a lot of things on conservatism. You should be right there in the mix saying, yeah, we're offering it all. We're going to give it to you. Um, it's up to you to decide, and I can help you find what you might want to experience or expose yourself to versus, no, 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 that book doesn't belong in here. Now, of course, there are 
what I like to call the social community standards. And that, of course, is something that librarians have to navigate as well, because you usually have the community as a funder. But we know what our mission and vision is, and a trained librarian will know how to walk that type road. But education is the key to helping people who are in those situations as the head of a library versus um, a degree librarian understand what a library can do in a variety of contexts. Very cool. Um, I want to see if there are any questions um, from the crowd. So once again, uh, for those of you maybe joining us in the lower right hand corner, you'll see a pink tab. If you click on that, you'll be brought up to a chat and you can go ahead and chat in there. We'll, we'll keep an eye out for questions. Um, and while we're waiting to see if anyone can, can bring those up, I just want to ask, you know, put your forecasting hat um, looking ahead. Mm. Is the, you know, the result of this, are we looking at more virtual services? Do we look at the idea that moving forward, um, you know, libraries need to, you know, people are going to either now want to stay away and, and got used to working from home and looking at virtual services and such, or is it a matter of everyone wanting to rush and suddenly be closer and connected? Um, you know, what are you thinking in, in six months when all of this is through and everyone is fine and dandy? Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. I would say there's, there's three schools of thought because I uh, tend to be a little bit more humanistic and I see depending, it, it'll roll out across this, at least our country and even parts of the world, I think in one of three ways. And sometimes there are going to be hybrids with this. There definitely is going to be an emphasis on looking at making sure that we have prepared um, for another event like this. So there will be large amounts of discussions on connectivity and internet services. For libraries, that is gonna be something that we will also navigate. That can be a positive. On another aspect, here's what's gonna be unique. We know for a fact, as humans, we are sociable creatures. We right now are doing this. We are wanting some form of a connection because if we couldn't do this, we would be angry, we would be sad, we would be depressed if we could not even get together on Blackboard right now and even have a conversation. Just imagine that, like, we had no way to even do this. That would make a lot of people almost repressed in a way. So I also think going forward, you will see a return uniquely to connection. You're probably going to see a lot of people already. There are people up here who have cabin fever and we just started this thing. Just think about that. Just started. And you are hearing people say, oh, it's going to be eight weeks. It could be three months. And I can't do this anymore. Well, that's going to be a really unique problem because we do want to have connection with others. We want to have experiential um, quests to do things, lectures and talks. I also predict you're going to see a revert back to the past to find those elements on how do we, in a sense, treat each other? What are we going to do? You're going to probably see a lot of people start trying to, if it is okay to do, and we really get through this and we tamp down what this virus is, you're going to see a lot of people want to have a human element to things again, conversation, connection. I'm quite sure there's going to be a lot of dinners going on, a lot of parties, <laughs> but that again is going to be if everything is okay. The third item is a bit more um, unique and probably a challenge. You could have an element where this works so well, what does it look like to now drive ourselves into efficiency? In mm -hmm. other words, we're not going to deal with anything else other than trying to go forward with life this way. That's a little bit more dystopic. And I hope that we don't go into that vein, but I believe you're going to see a new conversation on making sure people are having connectivity and that will take months to years, followed by a, a beautiful renaissance of what it means to have connection as a human in a variety of ways. And I think libraries, if we get through this and we can go back to having those items are going to be just going gangbusters and trying to provide human aspects to almost everything. I even predict you're going to start to see companies, for example, have people who will actually pick up the phone and you're not going to be <laughs> on wait times. I guarantee you because we're going to want that human connection. Be like, oh, There's no music. Oh, my goodness. A person answered the phone. Well, how? How are you? You'd be surprised right now. We all mm -hmm. are craving that. We're all craving it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Imagine if we do this for three months as predicted. We're going to yes. really crave human connection. We, 
calling up our cable companies instead of out of anger just to have a voice on the other end. Uh, well, Jason, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. Um, uh, and once again, we'll be sharing this around. I hope those of you um, will available can join us next Tuesday for the next... Oh, I do have one thing, David. Oh. Sorry. Yes. One last Final quick word. topic, because um, <laughs> we didn't have time to get into it. One aspect that is also going to come out of this, and this is for library staff and definitely for communities, I believe and predict there will also be a huge surge in health and wellness programs at libraries. Um, our own mental health, our own physical health, and a lot of virtual services, of course, there's tons of apps, but I really do predict that we will be coming out of this and libraries will be looking at how to also offer large, diverse, robust connections into health and wellness. Very cool, very cool. All right, so that, that's a good stop point. Once again, I hope Tuesday you'll be able to join us for, uh, Eric is, is gonna come and talk from the Royal Library of the Netherlands and so, uh, we're also going to be joined with a colleague of his at the story, um, really innovative program coming out of UK and London. So keep a look online for that. Um, also, once again, for those in the Eastern Hemisphere or in the Western United States or anyone who's an insomniac, uh, please join us uh, 9 a.m. Sydney time on Monday for just a general open chat discussion. Uh, and we'll keep moving forward. We'll have this archive up available hopefully by the end of the day. And I just want to thank uh, our colleagues at Public Library 2030 for helping uh, support this effort and continue on. Jason, please stay safe and healthy, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. I hope I've been of service, and I hope that I've offered a little bit of a respite from the nuances that we all are facing. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>